an incredibly tense two months between Canada and India. In September, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau stood up in the House of Commons and said there were, quote, credible allegations. The Indian government may have been involved in the killing of a Canadian Sikh leader, Hardeep Singh Nijar. Back in June, Nijar was murdered outside a Sikh temple in Surrey, B.C. The 45-year-old had been labelled a terrorist by India, accusations he denied when he was alive. India has also vehemently denied the allegation it was involved in the murder, but so far has not cooperated with an investigation. In fact, following the allegations, India issued a travel warning to its citizens coming to Canada, stopped issuing visas to Canadians, and unilaterally removed immunity for dozens of Canadian diplomats, forcing them to leave India en masse. Some visa services, however, were restored this week. So where does the relationship between the two countries stand now? And why won't India cooperate with Canada in its investigation? India's High Commissioner to Canada, Sanjay Kumar Verma, joins me for his first TV interview since Prime Minister Trudeau made that allegation. Hello, High Commissioner. Pleasure to welcome you to our studios. Thank you very much. It's such a lovely day. I really appreciate you making the time. I, I want to start off, uh, sir, with the latest news this week that India restored electronic visa services for Canadians. What should be interpreted from that? Uh, when we... Uh, when we suspended the e-visa services and other visa services as well, the main concern was our security and safety. And the security of not only myself in person, my consul generals and other consular staffs, other diplomatic staff. So what, and we did a continuous evaluation of the situation. And uh, during the last evaluation, we have come to a conclusion that now the security situation is relatively better than what used to be when we suspended uh, the visa uh, services and therefore we decided to resume e-visa services. Should Canadians interpret at all from the decision that things between uh, Canada and India in terms of the relationship between the two countries are improving? Uh, there, there's a lot of conversation going on, a lot of dialogue between the two governments and I feel that uh, most of it is very constructive. Uh, and uh, therefore, we would, I, would, I would say that, yes, the relationship uh, is better than what it was a couple of months back. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it's, it's uh, moving more towards more and more dialogue and probably taking it to the next step. The impression, I think, at the time of the suspension of those visa services among the public in Canada was that the decision was made as a retaliatory measure for the accusation that the Prime Minister levied against the Indian government. Can you respond to that? Not really. Uh, if you look at the main concern which we have, and what is the India's main concern in Canada, that some Canadian citizens are using Canadian soil to launch attack on sovereignty and territorial integrity of India, which is against any international law. India and Canada are both members of the United Nations. United Nations Article 2.4 very clearly says and the spirit is that, that no country should allow its soil to be used to target other countries' sovereignty and integrity, no, territorial integrity. So that is the core issue, which still remains there. But from this core issue, a lot of security concerns uh, come up. And uh, those security concerns are uh, more current, and therefore they are being taken care of to some extent, and we feel relatively safer. So I just want to be clear on that, and we'll get into that core concern that you outlined in a second, because I certainly do want to explore it. But the timing of all these decisions, for example, uh, to kick diplomats out of India or remove their immunity so they effectively had to leave, uh, to suspend the visa services, to issue a travel warning, all of that followed in succession right after the Prime Minister rose in the House of Commons on that day and levied the accusation. Are, are Canadians really to believe that none of that was in retaliation, that it's all just out of security concerns? So uh, on the retaliation side, of course, since one of our principal diplomats was uh, expelled from here, as persona non grata. So yes, we did retaliate on that. Uh, any action will have reaction. Uh, and similarly, we uh, declared persona non grata one of the uh, Canadian uh, diplomats who was at the Canadian High Commission in New Delhi. Others are a process of evaluation. Uh, since the emotions became very high, once the statements were made uh, uh, from Ottawa, and uh, a bit of emotion, uh, emotional elements will be there when the decisions are taken. Uh, but again, the core concern remains there. And therefore, we will keep talking to our interlocutors here to see what further can be done. When it comes to the uh, decision to remove immunity for the diplomats, 
what would it take to restore that? Is there any conversation taking place about that? Is there any possibility of those diplomats returning to India from, from where you sit? You know, uh, if I look at the Vienna Convention of Diplomatic Relations, uh, there is a particular article which is known as Article 11 uh, for those who are in the international law. Uh, that article very clearly states that uh, uh, if there is no specific agreement, then the rec receiving state can decide the size uh, of the mission, the purpose of the mission. Uh, at the moment, there is no specific agreement between India and Canada. Some countries have. Uh, so we would look at more dialogue and see how we can uh, uh, facilitate uh, better diplomatic presence of Canada in India and better Indian diplomatic presence uh, in Canada. But to be clear, the decision to remove their immunity was because of high emotions? And, and is that a really a, a rational approach given the significance of our, the, our two countries' relationship and the number of citizens affected on, on both sides? Not only. What I said was that emotional element was also a factor. Uh, but if uh, I can go beyond what I have said, uh, we have about 13 Indian diplomats in Canada altogether. Others are either administrative staff or they are consular uh, agents. We have two non-resident diplomats who live in, in Washington. They are defense services people, but accredited to Canada. So even if I take at the maximum level, we have 15 of us. Canada has 60 plus. So therefore, there has to be some kind of a uh, resemblance. Why? Why was that not a concern prior to September? Because the events which unfolded after uh, uh, the statements were made, we did not feel it was very friendly. So, so may I ask then, it, short of a resolution on those elements, uh, is there no possibility of the number of diplomats from Canada and India increasing until there is resolve on that matter? I won't say that because that matter was still there when Canada had a larger number of diplomats in India. So it all depends on how the diplomatic conversation continues, uh, how our concerns are understood in Canada, how Canadian concerns are understood in India. So it will be a package wherein we will f have to have mutual respect for each other and then find a solution which will be uh, beneficial for both of us. And you do feel like there is a path there? There is a path there, of course. Okay, let's get into those concerns that India has expressed, but also I would like to begin with the concerns that Canada has. And uh, High Commissioner, I'd like to ask you very bluntly, the accusation from the Prime Minister is that the government you represent is culpable to some degree in the assassination of Mr. Nijar, the murder of Mr. Nijar. Is the Indian government, was the Indian government a part of any of that in any capacity? Absolutely not. Decidedly not. And what we have said at that time as well, that this is motivated and absurd allegation. And this is still allegation. Whether we would call it credible allegation, that's the choice of word, but it's an allegation. Uh, so from the Indian government side, I can, I can assure you and your viewers that there was no government hand in the uh, uh, shooting of a Canadian citizen on a Canadian soil, as it is always called. We are a country of rule of law. And uh, uh, all the freedoms and everything has been uh, given in the Indian constitution, which was well before uh, uh, the 19, which was in 1950 when we adopted our constitution. So they are our pillars, will not go beyond that. Uh, so therefore what I feel is that the space which, are, which is available on some pretext or the other to these elements uh, needs to be evaluated. I would like to ask you though Mr. High Commissioner, if in fact India has no role in any of this, why is your government not cooperating in the investigation? So there are two points on that. Uh, one is that even without investigation being concluded, India was uh, convicted. Is that a rule of law? There should have... When the allegation was raised. How was India convicted? Because India was asked to cooperate. And if you look at the typical uh, uh, the criminal terminology, when someone asks us to cooperate, which means that you have already been convicted and you better cooperate. So we took it in a very different uh, uh, interpretation. But we always said that if there is anything specific and relevant and communicated to us, we will look into it. And that had been said from day one. 
So we have never said, of course we have not used the word cooperate because we feel that that is uh, humiliating. But we have always said that give us something specific and relevant and we look into it. So, so the National Security Advisor, for example, for this country was in India for a total of nine days, I believe, over August and September. Are, are you telling me that no specificity was shared with the Indian government by the National Security Advisor, that not a single, you know, single specific allegation was presented to the Indian government and, and asked for cooperation? So conversations took place, but we needed something specific and relevant to go back to our law or legal authorities to seek permission to do investigation that we want, we would have wanted to do. So till the time that those kinds of inputs are not there, in a country of uh, uh, rule of law, it will not be possible for us to move forward uh, on the investigations. But I, I, I see what you're saying about cooperation and the ask for cooperation, but I'm also thinking of criminal trials that take place here, for example, when it has something has been alleged and, and nobody has been convicted, the person who is accused has to cooperate in some way with the legal proceedings that take place, right? It's not necessarily a de facto conviction. It's just asking for you know, a very serious allegation to be taken as such and India to do all it can if, in fact, as you claim, the government is completely uh, innocent of any of the accusations to do all that it can to prove that. Absolutely. I, we have never said no. What, what all we are asking is give us something specific and relevant to move ahead. But Unless that is there, what do I follow up with? Well, I, ha I just have a hard time believing that our national security advisor, the top security official in this country, would go to your country for nine days and not say, you know, here's what we know, here's what we think happened. Can you please substantiate this one way or the other? Listen, till the time it is not a specific or relevant to the case, we will not be able to respond to it. There could be a lot of conversation. Conversations could have allegations. Conversation could have some facts of the case. But allegations and facts do not make it specific and relevant. So we need to have those facts and we are always ready to do that. Uh, if you look at the most recent incident where uh, uh, there are some allegations put out in one of the newspapers yes. against India. So let me also talk about that. Yes, I'll ask uh, you. So US did provide us inputs and we have already started following up on that. So and those inputs were, sorry. So No, I'm sorry, I was going to ask what are they so, <laughs> yeah. that, so that I so can So those inputs them. are nexus between gangsters, drug peddlers, terrorists and uh, gun runners in the US. And there is a belief that some of the Indian connections, now when I say Indian connections, it's not the government of India connections. India is 1.4 billion people. So some of the Indian connections are there. We are ready to investigate because we have got inputs which are legally presentable. Can, can you explain what you mean? I guess I, I, I'm just, I'm curious yes. what that means compared to what you're saying Canada has not presented. So what, what are inputs? Are they documents, for example, that they've presented you, intelligence that they shared with you? And are you saying that Canada has not done anything similar? See, I don't have, I don't oversee India-US relations. My mandate is India-Canada. So I'll not be able to go in depth in that. But what I'm telling you is from the statement which has been issued from India. And if I read this statement uh, which is in front of me, uh, during the course of recent discussions on India-US security cooperation, the US side shared some inputs pertaining to nexus between organized criminals, gun runners, terrorists and others. The inputs are a cause of concern for both countries and they decided to take necessary follow-up action. On its part, India takes such inputs seriously since it impinges on our own national security uh, uh, interests as well. Issues in the context of US inputs are already being examined by relevant departments in India. The accusation that you're referencing there, the statement, I just want to make sure our viewers understand that uh, th there was a report this week from the London-based Financial Times newspaper, a separate report kind of confirming it in the Associate Press, pardon me, Associated Press, which cited unnamed officials who said U.S. authorities had stopped a conspiracy to assassinate six separatists, uh, Gurupwant Singh Panan, a dual Canada-U.S. citizen. The Financial Times also said that the U.S. Um, 
uh, thwarted the plot to kill that individual who was a lawyer in New York, who's among the organizers of a symbolic referendum on six separation and was a personal friend actually of Mr. Nijar here in Canada. The newspaper said that the U.S. authorities had filed criminal charges related to the matter and India was investigating. Are you saying, can I take from that, that it is the filing of the charges that, that, that separates this because there have not yet been charges filed? in Canada that, that, that prompted different action from India and that is informing the Indian decision not to cooperate in Canada? See, one is that the uh, investigation in case of the U.S., as, as far as I know and understand, because again, I don't oversee India-U.S. relations, uh, is at much advanced stage and therefore I presume that there would be better information uh, shared with India. And so once again, just for the record, I want to make sure you're saying none of that information, no intelligence, no evidence, nothing underlying the very serious accusation the Prime Minister I don't think would have made unless he thought the uh, allegations were credible. Uh, none of that has been presented to the Indian government. So I'll again repeat my uh, position that there is no specific or relevant information for us to look into. Okay, on that note, High Commissioner, I'll leave it there. I appreciate your time today very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.